welcome you all this morning. We have Olivier Duprier, who is Deputy Chief Statistician in the Development Data Group within the Development Economics of the World Bank. So I'd like to welcome Olivier to the stage. Thanks a lot, Audrey, for that. Um, so I was asked to take a few minutes to deliver some welcoming remarks. So the first remark is welcome. Um, welcome back to the second day of this workshop. I hope you will enjoy today as much as I enjoyed yesterday. Um, I'm coming here, obviously, and probably like every one of us with some you know, specific personal interests. My interest in attending this meeting is really to try to figure out how uh, the experience that we were sharing in this, uh, in this meeting can help me shape my own work program, the program of uh, the, the team that, I, that I'm part of. I'm reporting to Harshan, so I had the privilege to be part of the Office of the Chief Statistician at the World Bank, with Indermit also um, as our boss, so that's for the context. I'm also very much interested to learn more and try to figure out how we can you know, tap into all this experience that uh, is being shared to define how we can better work together with Paris 21 and with all the partners in the partnership uh, in the future, especially uh, working with countries in low and middle income countries in activities related to AI, machine learning, and the modernization of the data production, data dissemination, data management process. This is something that we're doing in our team. We, we have a small team of data engineers, data scientists who are very, very smart. Um, it's still a small team, but um, one of the core objectives of the team that I'm part of is really to help assess, develop, uh, and disseminate tools that have to be completely open. So the objective of our team is really to be relevant, not only to the bank, but also to, to partners. Um, so I was given total freedom by Johannes to, to share some of my you know, takeaways from yesterday. So I'm going to, to start with a intimate speech. Um, I enjoyed it very much, and I'm pretty sure that this is something that we all share. I always like listening to Indermit, especially when he goes a little bit off his talking point. Um, what I found very, very powerful in his statement is the blame he put on us for being so slow. You know, some of us will remember from that speech the, the what did he call it, the, the, the Gill Law. Um, Johannes will remember that uh, Indermit mentioned that there's a lot of money for AI and for, for, for the, the data agenda. I think the most powerful statement by Indermit, coming from someone who is a senior VP and chief economist in an organization like the bank, telling us that we are too slow in supporting the implementation of AI, I think that's a very, very powerful statement. This is something we're not completely used to in the bank. Very often, you know, the, especially the, the, the geeks at the bank working on AI, we're more used to be told that we're going too fast. So having someone telling us that we're going too slow, especially someone at that level, it's a nice balancing experience. And I think that will really help us a lot in the, in the future. Um, Indemit told us that we are too slow and that we are much better in situation of crisis. Um, that's probably true. I'm not sure that AI has the status of being a crisis, but it might become a crisis if we don't do it fast uh, and well. In the put a little bit of you know, that in his speech when he said, okay, AI is great, but if you don't have electricity, you know, what do you do? If you don't have internet, what do you do? If you don't speak any of the language, you know, French, Spanish, English, Chinese, what do you do? So there, there are a lot of obstacles for a lot of you know, communities that might be left behind if we're not really careful. So part of the reason why we are slow at the bank is that we understand that AI has, you know, to, to, to be implemented responsibly, that there are a lot of, you know, challenge in this area. Um, the challenge that we're facing at the bank for bringing AI outside the bank are not just budget or bureaucracy. I think the risk aversion is one of the key problems. We do a lot of AI within the bank. I mean, Jim, when he presented StatGPT, you know, showed that there's a lot of things happening also within the, the, the boundaries of IMF. We're not always brave enough, I think, to put everything out. It's coming, but, you know, it's probably a, a little bit slow. Um, there are reasons for that, but I think that's moving the, the 
you know, the level of aversion that, uh, the aversion to, to risk that we're willing to take has probably to be uh, moved um, a, a little bit. That has to be done, you know, together with a very, very, very strong commitment to be as open and as transparent as we can. The, the bank is well known for the open data. I mean, China is here. Remember 2010, the bank uh, started its uh, open data initiative. We also have an open, uh, open knowledge strategy. We have hundreds and hundreds of thousands of documents accessible to everyone. We're not there yet with code uh, and science. So we want to push also for open code, open science, and David Satola yesterday mentioned that open sourcing and being open in this area is also something that our legal department seeks to, to enable. Um, in his statement also, um, Oliver Wise mentioned very, very briefly and quickly um, the NIST, the, the National Institute for Standards and Technology of the U.S. Probably that, that was uh, mentioned so quickly that not many of us noticed that. Um, this institute developed um, AI risk um, assurance framework or risk assessment framework. I, I don't remember the exact title. I think this is something that we need to take inspiration um, from. Not so much for managing the risk of AI at the bank, but to really understand what is the risk for the population that might be left behind if we don't have the, the, the right strategy. So that, that's for in the mid. Then, then we heard from Google. Um, it, it was a very interesting discussion on what Google and what AI can do for, um, I mean, for all of us, basically, for the planet, for people. Um, when we had this discussion, I was actually reversing the, 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 the question, wondering, and that's part also from what, what Jim uh, presented earlier in the day, what can we do to help Google? I think that that's a key question that you know we need to uh, to address as well. We all use Google, um, you know, and you've, you've seen the change in the way Google helps you uh, find the information you need. A few years ago, you search for Google, you have a very nicely ranked list of uh, URLs. You pick the one that you think is the most relevant, which typically was within the, the top ten, uh, and you had the information you needed from the content provider. These days, the first thing you will do, or you, you will see on the Google page very often, will be the answer to your question before it gives you the, um, the, the, the links. So you have the answer, you have the sponsored content, and then way below, you have actually the links. Um, the, the, this is, or this can be great, but the experience I have with it is a little bit uneven. Sometimes it's fantastic, sometimes I really get the wrong answer. And not because of hallucination. I mean, Jim mentioned hallucination yesterday. That's what you will get if you go to OpenAI. Um, if you go to Google, the problem, if I may, I mean, I see Prem here in the, in the room, is that the algorithm will decide for you what is the most relevant source of information on which it will build the answer. Uh, it is not always the most, you know, authority. How would you call that? I mean, there, it's not necessarily the source that has the, the, the highest level of authority. And I think that's part of the reason is us, the data community. We, we don't really provide information in a way that is optimal for Google to, to digest. And I think they are a very key partner. A lot of people will go to Google or Bing or others to find information. They will get the right answer from there. They need to be better served by uh, our community of data producers or organizations helping with the uh, data dissemination. And this is why the, the next session we had yesterday on data quality was very, very uh, interesting and, and important, I think. I liked, and that's probably one of the things that I will remember, you know, the most and for the long time, the statement by Oliver on uh, not machine readability but machine understandability and the importance to invest in very, very, very strong metadata. Um, I, I think this is probably one of the most critical things that we need to do, and I mean, I'm, I'm talking also to, to you, Johannes, when we're talking about, you know, strategizing at the national level, a lot of support should go to data creation. If we want to help countries and if we want to enable AI, it's not necessarily by, you know, teaching policymakers how to do prompt engineering that, that we're going to achieve that. It is by investing in dig digitizing data, in making some of the data that are locked, you know, accessible, in very well documented database with API access, that's how we're going to enable uh, AI. And that's how we're going to make sure that the right data ends up on Google. Uh, AI is very good. We, we had that in the discussion from, uh, by, by Meta yesterday. AI is very good at detecting hate speech and things like that. They become very good at that. I don't think there is any equivalent to detect bad data or fake data. 
Uh, it is very easy today to, to create fake videos, fake image, fake everything. It is as easy to create fake data. Accidentally or intentionally, it is really easy to do. So if you create fake data, make it really appealing to search engines, they might end up you know, above the, the data from the, the, the most uh, respectful agencies. So for me, trust in data basically means trust in the source of data. I don't trust data, I trust the source. So I will trust StatGPT because I know that there is IMF behind. I will not necessarily trust you know, a source that I don't know much about. So that, that's for uh, quality. Um, then we had um, decision on, I mean, the, the, this panel on decision, decision making. Um, it was very interesting to, to hear from Gail about the importance for decision maker to have data from different sources and, and different types, you know, very easily accessible in, in, in a more, more integrated manner. I think that's very powerful. So the graph database, you know, for, for the gigs is something that we really need to, to think about instead of letting people find one indicator at a time, give them a more complete picture that, that's essential. But what I found extremely interesting was also the, the statement, uh, is Samuel here? You know, somewhere from the, the, the statistics office of, of Ghana, 20-something um, year ago, it was before Johannes was manager of PAS 21. Uh, I remember attending some of the meeting of PAS 21. And at that time, you know, the idea was to take, bring decision makers, bring data produce, put in the same room, you know, and magic will happen. There, there was never any chemistry there. So never, I, I have never seen any magic happen there. You know, they talk, they discuss, they separate and, and nothing really changed. Um, what Samuel mentioned yesterday, um, using AI as basically the intermediary between, you know, data producers and good data and policy makers, I think that might be the trigger that will really help uh, data being used by, uh, for, for decision making in a much more efficient way. Uh, statisticians, especially official statisticians, should never pretend to become decision makers, but having good AI system that can interact with data the way Jim mentioned yesterday, starting with please and, uh, you know, a very convers conversational mode that will take us from descriptive analysis and maybe predictive analysis to more prescriptive analysis um, by decision maker. I think that's something that can be really, you know, a major transformation. Again, it requires that you have the right data in the right format in the right platforms. Um, in, um, I mean, the, the last session on regulation and ethics, uh, you know, I, I'm not at all a lawyer. Uh, it was a little bit difficult for me to follow everything. What I got from that is that uh, we often talk about IT as the enabling, uh, you know, factor for um, AI and data science in the bank. I think having people like David Satola on our side is as essential for enabling the, the use of AI as it is to, to have servers and IT experts and others. So I'll finish on this. Um, because I realized I'm taking time probably from my friend Wolfgang, who will tell you about how the world will look like tomorrow. So, thank you.